Okay. So um, I think uh, Dr. Arbeta already started mentioning uh, some of the issues uh, mentioned in the book. There are actually a whole gamut of issues that were discussed because, yeah, it required a book length treatment. But we will not be able to focus on any one of those issues, but rather this presentation uh, aims to provide a broad strokes uh, presentation of all of the contents of the book. First of all, why did we write it? No? We called it a revitalized irrigation program in the title, and that's no coincidence, because if you look at the trend in irrigation, there was a heyday way back in the 1970s, uh, the martial law years, where the investment, so this is the public investment in irrigation chart. Uh, this is all translated uh, inflation corrected prices, no? So there was this heyday here, but then there was after, from the 1980s onwards, when the Philippines started uh, experiencing massive fiscal crisis, there was this collapse all the way up to the early 2000s. The resurgence happens from 2005 onwards. And so we're interested in seeing whether all of the billions that have been invested, accumulated since 2005, uh, what, uh, what impact has that had on our irrigation sector? Now, you might wonder why there was this resurgence in investment. Well, there was a world food price crisis in 2008. That's an interesting point because right now, there's again a discussion of a current uh, food price crisis. Uh, including fuel crisis and even fertilizer crisis. The resurgence also came uh, when the Philippines' economic growth was gathering momentum. And that means there is now widening fiscal space. So if there was narrowing fiscal space in the early 80s that led to the collapse of irrigation investment, then when there was an expansion in fiscal space, then we can uh, probably justify the expansion also as well in irrigation investment because of the renewed government commitment now towards finally completing the task of irrigation. So the country, of course, has a fixed land area. And out of that fixed land area, there is a more or less fixed uh, area that has been targeted as having high potential for irrigation. Based on the current performance, uh, about the time that we started this study, say 2015, the ratio of the potential of, of the actual to the potential area was about 57%. By 2022, this year, the target is to reach 65% uh, of potential. All of this was happening under the backdrop of irrigation, so a major policy change in the sector, aside from increasing investment. On the demand side, the man is waiving irrigation service fees um, for especially for national and even communal systems under the act that Dr. Urbet already mentioned. So given that resurgence, the idea now is that we should do a stock taking and that's the whole objective of this book. Given all of these expenditures, can we compare it to the benefits received, both the farmers and the economy at large? And in doing this stock taking, we actually looked at, we looked at the cross section of national and communal irrigation systems. National systems, the large ones were uh, all visited by the study team. So you saw a wide range of authors. Uh, we are multidisciplinary. We had uh, economists uh, from the social sciences, others from the social sciences, as well as uh, engineers, no? Uh, agricultural engineers specializing in uh, uh, water resources and irrigation. So of course, communal irrigation systems, difficult to find a representative sample of that, but we did visit numerous ones uh, in Luzon, Visayas, and Mindanao. So there's an actual structure to the selection of these systems, but I don't have time to provide in detail the methodology for this. Please refer to the book, which is freely downloadable from the PIDS website. And this book is actually a culmination of a series of studies. So this was not the first and only time that we did this study. Since 2012, once we noticed that there was this revitalization of the irrigation program, we thought that we should uh, conduct an evaluation. Now, it's a vast topic, so we thought that we should structure it around the project cycle. So we structured our assessment, even our recommendations, starting from the planning and the design phase, to the implementation phase, to the actual operations phase, and after operations, monitoring and evaluation phase. 
we looked at the performance, design, management, and governance, and whole gamut of issues. And we claim that it is a state-of-the-art assessment using the most current uh, knowledge, at least at the time the book was uh, formulated uh, in the field of uh, irrigation sector assessment. So we covered, these are uh, the chapters of the book, uh, an overview chapter, then the types of irrigation systems, national and communal, so chapters and three. Then broad view of water resources uh, in chapter four, irrigation water governance, chapter five, assessment of the Free Irrigation Service Act, uh, specific chapter, a benefit cost analysis, and a synthesis assessment, chapter eight. So this, the material from this, for this presentation is drawn from, mostly from chapter eight. Now, as a caveat, as I present the key findings and recommendations, uh, you might be wondering, but it, uh, a lot of them are pretty critical. And no doubt, any large scaling of a, a project like this uh, will, will have critical sounding recommendations because we'll be noticing uh, uh, certain areas for improvement. And we should commend the National Irrigation uh, Administration because they were very helpful to us. Uh, they were the ones who provided support, uh, extensive support. Uh, uh, when we did our field work, uh, we relied very heavily on the cooperation from focus group meetings and key informant discussions, including with the irrigators associations, which were themselves mostly organized by the NIA. So uh, we, we, are, we would rather uh, approach this from a constructive perspective in terms of improving further uh, investments in the sector going forward. So we say, I said that we will cover this in terms of the various stages. We start with project identification. Off the bat, we noticed that there was an element uh, of um, being sort of rushed in terms of resources and time for project preparation. No? There was also um, lack of consultative process in the project design. So that later, when there was an uh, operations and maintenance phase, they had little operational flexibility because of the need. The need of that phase was not properly reflected no, in, in the, uh, the design phase. Now, one reason why there was a possible lacking of project preparation is that there was uh, a diminution of in-house capability for science-based project design. So what happened is actually the, the explanation, maybe it's also explained in later slides, but I'll explain it now. The institution of uh, irrigation uh, governance and investment, which is housed in National Irrigation Administration, it also actually experienced that, that decline in investment. So there was a rationalization that had happened all the way up to the early 2000s. However, when there was a decision to do a resurgence, the, the, uh, the administration had already been downsized. So a lot of the expertise had already been lost because of um, there was an anticipation that the whole irrigation sector would actually be um, either devolved to local government and or uh, to uh, water users, namely the farmers themselves. But there was a recentralization effort, as it were, because of this massive uh, investment uh, program since 2008 onwards. Hence, you know, the, the, the human resources fell behind the uh, expenditure resources for the funding. There was also noticeably a uh, lack of coordination of roles with other agencies and even local government units. Note that local government units are supposed to have jurisdiction over uh, uh, small scale irrigation systems. This is under the Agriculture and Fisheries Modernization Act of 1998, but in practice, it's still largely handled uh, and supported by the NIA. Uh, the NIA has been housed uh, since uh, around mid-2015 or so, certain time, uh, under the office of the president rather than away from its uh, previous home in the Department of Agriculture. So there was now a disjoint this joint uh, planning and targeting and prioritization between the DA and the NIA henceforth. One reason why coordination is difficult is that there are at least 13 agencies mentioned no, that are somehow involved, whether centrally or peripherally, or with an important aspect of irrigation planning, design, appraisal. 
spread across various agencies, Office of the President, uh, Department of Environment and Natural Resources, Department of Agrarian Reform, and of course, Department of Agriculture. So there are partnership mechanisms and interagency committees, but based on our FGDs and uh, uh, informant interviews, they are not been uh, sufficient to address the coordination failures. From the design phase, now we move to the implementation phase, which is mostly by procurement, okay? So uh, there, there is, it's not that common that we do a force account or in-house uh, production of irrigation facilities. However, even the procurement phase, when we contract it out, there is often, uh, there is sometimes a failure of bidding, which is a source of implementation delay. There have been also noted delays in budget releases. So of course, we have this perennial debate between the agency and the DBM, uh, who is at fault why the budget has not been released. DBM will say that uh, the legal requirements for the release were not uh, fulfilled. The agency said we fulfilled, but uh, the money is still not there. But whoever is at fault, it turns out that uh, these uh, delays in the disbursement tend to also delay the actual implementation and construction. Now, in fairness, farmers interviewed for the study reported, so we went through a number of uh, irrigators association, both national and communal systems. They actually said they have very little to complain about in terms of uh, implementation. So from their perspective, mukang on time naman daw yung implementation of project. So maybe the reports about delays uh, are uh, further upstream, say from the viewpoint of the foreign donor, for instance, that happened to fund the projects. But from the viewpoint of the IAs, from the even from the organization phase to the actual construction and turning over, they were largely satisfied. Moving on from implementation to operations and maintenance. Uh, so, Jan, uh, here we saw a lot. Of, we, here we have a lot of observations. Our engineers encountered a lot of observations. No? Uh, they found increasing. So there was degradation. So remember, we started from 2012, and in fact there was increasing degradation and poor system performance across various scales. So whether we talk about the largest systems down to the smallest communal systems and the in-between reservoir systems, we have this uh, evidence of, uh, or observation of degradation and poor system performance. What do we mean by this? For instance, control structures that are in need of rehabilitation and improvements. So sluice gates that actually could no longer move and then they're permanently up or permanently down position, no? Uh, canals that had been filled up with silt, so are in need of desilting. Uh, embankments that had uh, collapsed and are in need of reshaping or heightening. Now, when we try to trace why we had these so many observations, it turns out perhaps one of the root causes is lack of funds to do proper operations and maintenance. So what happens is all of these uh, problems tend to accumulate because there was not enough uh, uh, resource allocation towards operations and maintenance. What happens is once the system has deteriorated sufficiently or there is a large typhoon uh, and then the, the, the deterioration uh, even is aggravated with this natural disaster, then we do an, a rehabilitation to arrest, if not slow down, the further deterioration. Now, there used to be an automatic source of funding uh, for operations and maintenance because the farmers themselves, there was a cost recovery scheme called the irrigation service fee. But this has been removed and this has been replaced by a national government subsidy, which is uh, kind of fixed. I believe it's uh, currently at $7 billion, uh, per year, covering everything. No? Uh, please, uh, the NIA discussant could, could please uh, update us, no? engineer, uh, later. So we noticed that because of this, uh, we no longer uh, require farmers to do uh, to contribute to uh, the operations and maintenance. This seems to have placed the irrigation management transfer scheme in jeopardy. So we were in the middle of turning over actually these systems, including national systems, to varying extent to user associations, the, the irrigators associations. But since they have the incentive for them to do so has been sort of uh, taken out because they are no longer required to contribute to the upkeep of these systems. So one consequence that we can see in terms of the numbers is that despite huge investments, 
the expansion of the area, of the new area, seems to be really, really slow, okay? So for instance, for 2010 to uh, 2016, we noticed that, and when we tried to break, when we tried to break down the profile of actual projects being funded, it turns out that in that time span where there was already this multi tens of billions of peso annual investment, 67% of the expenditure actually went to projects which were not new. So rehabilitation projects or restoration projects. Only 33% were directed to new or mostly new projects. So if you're wondering why the expansion in new areas has been very slow, it's because the, those vast uh, expenses were actually not, mostly not devoted, at least up to 2016, no? to uh, expanding new areas. So sometimes in Senate hearings, we, we hear that, oh, we, we, you know, the senators complain uh, that, uh, you know, maglalaan kami ng so much funds for, uh, for uh, irrigation, but then we re the NIA reports only a small expansion of new area. Well, that's one of the explanations. So what's have been happening is, uh, why is there such a huge investment, almost 70% going to uh, rehabilitation or restoration? It's because the one that I mentioned in the previous slide, that there has been underfunding of the O&M, uh, underestimation of the funding requirements of the O&M, and therefore the problems accumulate, and then in one shot, uh, a project is packaged to try to rehabilitate or restore the system. So from the um, from the uh, uh, M and &E, uh, sorry O and M now we move to the monitoring and evaluation phase. So systems management. So it's now in this phase of this systems management. Now there's a, also the management task of monitoring and evaluating you know, the the operations of those systems. However, that phase, the systems management, currently generates insufficient data for proper monitoring. For instance, key parameters such as water flow were not being monitored. So, not uh, so of course, major, big, major systems, they are being monitored, but there are many uh, medium to smaller scale systems where the data uh, is not updated or is not being collected. So, aside from quantity of water per unit time or water flow, there's also a, a, an absence of monitoring of water quality. So uh, the national, our review of national irrigation systems also conducted a water quality uh, analysis, and we found that there are grave concerns, uh, or serious, maybe not grave, no serious concerns about water quality, usually traceable to illegal dumping from the communities that live around in and around the irrigation systems. Uh, so illegal dumping of solid waste. There are also in selected systems salt water intrusion problems. And this can adversely affect the health of farming systems, the uh, systems that are being uh, irrigated, as well as even the surrounding community, you know, because uh, the canals become uh, a means of uh, transmitting noxious, uh, noxious substances and even pathogens, depending on uh, the degree of, uh, of quality, of uh, the deterioration in the quality of the uh, water in the system. So, those are all of our observations. Let me devote uh, the last few minutes of this presentation to our recommendations. So we, we noted that uh, human resources had been lacking for uh, actually policy-related reasons, uh, especially within NIA. Unfortunately, uh, all of the irrigation investment was not really channeled towards uh, restoring the previous level of human resource capacity. So what we recommend is have to admit that we need a lot of human resources for project implementation. So uh, we hear right now that the new administration is looking at right sizing, and that's the correct term to use. It's not just taking people out, but sometimes putting new people in with the right competencies because there's not enough current personnel right now to fill up the need you know, that is being created by the expansion of uh, government programs. There's also uh, the need to improve even the human resource capacity of irrigation users, especially if we're continuing to for our push of uh, participatory uh, uh, management of irrigation systems. So definitely even our irrigators associations, for instance, our water masters uh, might actually be delegated you know, to, to those uh, systems. 
But def definitely that kind of task uh, will, will require uh, a little bit uh, better uh, set of skills uh, for, for our farmer organizations. There should be an increased coordination uh, with between the irrigators, so, so the DENI itself, and the Department of Agriculture. So we can we can uh, actually say bring bring the the NIA back to the DA, as well as with the local government units. Because the local government units, yun din naman ang unang takbuhan uh, ng mga farmers, no? Uh, and in the, we're not saying that uh, LGUs do not help at all. We've encountered uh, instances in the field na nakakatulong naman, papahiram ng bako no? <laughs> para mag-do some uh, maintenance. Pero significant works, uh, we have not been actually able to see that unless uh, the funding came from outside uh, the LGU itself. So let's say we have a foreign assisted project that happened to be in that LGU that supported irrigation. That's where we see uh, strong involvement of the LGU. So in terms of internal financial resources, talagang kapos sila. So, better coordination among the various institutions engaged in governing water resources, so including the TNR, uh, the DAR, for instance, uh, because they're the ones uh, who provide a lot of uh, program beneficiary development for agrarian reform areas, as, as well as, of course, the TA for all other areas. When we do estimates of what is the, poten the real potential, <coughs> excuse me, the real potential area, <coughs> In selected systems, we notice some overestimation. So later on, when we try to report the other parameters like uh, service area to uh, design area, because it could have been overestimated the design area. Because uh, it turns out that some of the land that was being projected for use of irrigation has been converted already uh, by the time the irrigation is already online and operating. So these have to be anticipated, no? especially since a lot of these systems uh, uh, in, in Central Luzon and Calabar Zone uh, are in areas that have been uh, either converted to residential or industrial uses. So um, also consider uh, if, if the availability of water for a particular irrigation system might have been overestimated given the, the integrity or the state of uh, forest cum water resources of the near of the watershed supporting uh, that that irrigation system, so issues of water availability as well as other georeference data. So one of the charts uh, or maps developed in the study was to show that uh, there was a, a map on soil erosion uh, versus the map of the watershed area showed that there was high erosion rate. In the projected uh, in in the, uh, the, the the watershed area supposedly for the system, which means if it's eroded, there was probably lack of vegetative cover already in that uh, uh, in that uh, target uh, in that uh, watershed. So there was probably uh, insufficient coordination with the Department of uh, Environment and Natural Resources, which is the jurisdiction naman over the management of forest resources. So yung mga ganong issues of coordination need to be um, uh, really uh, addressed. When uh, in the project appraisal stage, there should be rigorous benefit-cost analysis. So if, if we know that there is a typical tendency to overestimate the area uh, over time or underestimate the cost, uh, this should be already uh, uh, anticipated so that you know we don't invest the money uh, to, to, to um, areas where potentially the irrigation project is not actually worthwhile and deprive other areas and other communities where the, the irrigation investment makes sense but somehow kinulang uh, sila, kinapos sila ang investment. So important to make really rigorous benefit cost analysis down to the project level. So if there's a need to adjust the physical target, maybe our physical target is too ambitious. No? Uh, we, we don't have enough uh, irrigation area within the given time frame and the need for doing feasibility studies. Then pues, we, let's, let's adjust the physical target, right? It's better to, rather than rush to complete so-called task of covering the entire potential area, we end up um, overspending in some areas and underspending in other areas. 
The system's design needs to be improved by incorporating terrain features, water availability, operational flexibility, user participation, and even crop diversification away from rice. So we noted in the field some tendency. I'm sure uh, Nia is already veering away from this. No? But in, during the time that uh, we were conducting the study, there was a strong and heavy bias towards uh, irrigation systems, towards flooded, no, uh, 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 flooded agriculture that is common in rice growing. But other designs might be more useful in other areas, such as sugarcane areas, corn growing areas. So the, the, the engineering is somewhat different. So uh, if we allow for greater user participation and in inputs from users, there might be a more flexible designing of, um, of these systems, allowing for more diversified cropping systems aside from uh, continuous flooded rice agriculture. Especially now, by the way, no, dagdagan ko lang, na we have a Rice Tarification Act that uh, allows more imports uh, in, into the rice sector. And therefore, it also encourages in certain marginal rice areas, especially diversification, to improve the livelihoods of uh, erstwhile rice growing farmers. Now, in many cases, I mentioned a while ago the benefit cost issue. Uh, medyo kakapusin yung justification irrigation lab. However, if these facilities are integrated into multi-purpose projects like hydropower, which is common in a few large systems, no? or uh, in integrate uh, drainage or flood control or other such no, multi-purpose projects, uh, and, and uh, say potable water supply, then there is a possibility with these multi-purpose projects to uh, be able to meet those benefit cost uh, ratio uh, standards. No? Procurement and uh, implementation bottlenecks, we need to troubleshoot the process flow and see how we can accelerate this. For operations and maintenance, there should be uh, adoption of what is called asset management method. I think this is now the current best practice now towards the uh, uh, operations and maintenance of irrigation systems, which incorporates financial, economic, social, and engineering considerations towards sustained functionality in a cost-effective way. The ONM funding, which I said has, has been underestimated, taasan na lang siguro natin yung estimation. That's why it's, it's really important that uh, we, we devote enough funding now rather than, you know, wait for the needs to accumulate and hope that there will be uh, isang bagsak na no, malaking funding for restoration and irrigation. Better to have a more even distribution of the funding over time by allocating enough ONM. Integration of water shed management into irrigation system management. There were uh, identified 150 plus, I think, no, uh, critical watershed areas uh, under a DA project before. Uh, I'm, I'm wondering if there are any updates as to whether uh, those critical watersheds, there's been proper coordination with uh, appropriate agency like DNR and local governments uh, in terms of uh, improving the state of those critical watersheds. Uh, data collection needs to be improved and uh, latest information technologies deployed, for instance, parcellary surveys based on GIS so that a, the whole command area can be properly mapped down to the parcel level and the canal level. Uh, towards the adoption of more analytical approaches, I, as I mentioned, geospatial and mapping approaches. Uh, resource assessment of water potential. We, we tried in one of those chapters to uh, provide a demonstration of how uh, a modeling approach, a mathematical modeling and simulation approach might be helpful in uh, irrigation system evaluation and um, and, monit and uh, uh, future operations. Oh, okay. So uh, that was the whole gamut of, uh, of, of our, our findings. So again, uh, going forward, we know that we will continue uh, to invest heavily in our irrigation, even now more because food suddenly, uh, it's always been top priority, but again, elevated now because of the current 5Fs crisis we're undergoing. No? Food, feed, fertilizer, fuel, and finance. No? Uh, hopefully, uh, this uh, book will be of renewed relevance uh, under these conditions. Thank you.